So our next uh, presenter today, uh, we'll be talking about the new FAA advisory circular for heliports, the two Delta. Uh, Robert Bassey is FAA airports. Um, Robert, I assume you're online. Thanks, Rex. Um, so as Rex has mentioned, uh, my, my plan today is really to provide you on a status update on the revision to uh, heliport design advisory circular. Um, uh, I'm going to caveat um, this presentation in, in a couple of ways. First of which uh, is um, I'm really not going to uh, adjudicate any comments that have to do with specific changes to standards at this meeting. Um, we have a process for that that I'm sure most of you are aware of, um, which I'll touch on as part of this presentation. But obviously, if um, you want to share comments and input, uh, definitely welcome those, and I'll be um, notating that um, to take back. Um, so with that, um, so uh, for the uninitiated, which should be very few of you, uh, the Heliport Design AC is really the uh, primary reference in the U.S. for uh, design and development of private and public use heliports um, in the U.S. Um, this is the ninth revision, I believe the first uh, 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 AC was published in 1959, um, and prior to this revision, I think our last uh, AC uh, revision was published in uh, 2012. So um, we're really excited about the uh, the new update and um, and the way things are shaping uh, shaping up here. So next slide, please, Rex. Uh, so I work within the airport engineering division within the FAA Office of Airports, and collectively we manage uh, over 80 advisory circulars. Um, and these are essentially standards for design, safety, construction, equipment, signage, pavements, to name a few. Um, the, these, these standards become mandatory for projects that use either AIP or PFC funds um, to support those projects. Um, Outside of that mandate, uh, it's essentially an advisory standard. Um, in addition to advisory circulars, um, we obviously interface with our counterparts within ICAO, um, try to harmonize uh, to the best extent possible. Um, and also we have uh, engineering briefs, which are essentially interim guidance that we um, provide um, for certain uh, airport projects and for certain um, uh, airport design and construction standards. Next slide, please. So here's my second caveat. Um, this is a summary briefing. Um, this, whatever I share here is preliminary um, and subject to change because the, the uh, review process is currently on the way and um, more than likely there will be significant changes uh, in the coming weeks and months that are not captured here. Next slide, please. And uh, just as a, you know, uh, as a kind of overview here, uh, the AC is a comprehensive guide to heliport owners and operators for, for different types of heliports. Uh, generally, that, that amounts to general aviation, transport, and hospital heliports. Um, and we have about close to 6,000 at least documented heliports in the US. Um, the, Oversight authority that the FAA has at the federal level um, obviously differs uh, depending on if the heliport is categorized as public use or private use. Um, and um, generally, that's that's how it's managed at the federal level. But you know, uh, some compliance is required at the state or local level, uh, depending on you know local and municipality code criteria. So, um, next slide, please. So this is what the new table of contents looks like um, in the draft. Um, for the people that are, that are familiar with previous uh, drafts of previous revisions to the AC, um, this might look a little different. Um, and, and a lot of this has to do with kind of our thinking coming into this review cycle. Um, there have been several safety analysis done on um, helicopter accidents at and around heliports. Um, and it's been very clear direct correlations found between essentially adherence to our heliport design criteria and 
reduction in risk exposure and um, heliport acts, helicopter accidents uh, at a heliport. So um, we're pretty confident in, in our current guidance. Um, you know, so we're not looking to make any drastic changes per se. Obviously, where there, there are improvements that could be made and clarity provided, we, we would definitely look to do that. But well, this is definitely not an overhaul. So coming through this, a lot of the things we're thinking about were essentially were editorial. Um, you know, uh, so one of that had to do with restructuring the way the AC was was um, you know uh, constructed um, in terms of dealing with a lot of what we saw as redundancies um, and um, some things that were not so clear and easy to follow. So one of that has to do with organizing the chapters a little differently. So you see here we have an introduction chapter. We essentially have a heliport design chapter in which we, and I'll, I'll touch on this later, which we consolidate a lot of the um, different chapters. Uh, we don't longer have a general aviation health transport and a hospital heliport chapter separately, and which kind of reiterates information that existed in the previous chapter. Uh, we try to consolidate all of that within one chapter. We broke out taxiways, taxi routes, and helicopter parking in a separate chapter. We have a chapter on visual aids. We have a chapter dealing with heliport facilities on, on airports. We have a chapter uh, which we had before that um, essentially deals with instrument operations. And then we have our site safety elements um, chapter. All right, next slide, please. So um, let's talk schedule. Next slide, please. Um, so currently, um, this is the uh, schedule for completion of the um, draft AC. Now, um, this, this schedule has been affected uh, definitely by um, the uh, COVID and everything that uh, kind of came with that as far as our inability to actually um, get a lot of stuff that we're looking to get done done in, in a timely fashion last year. So uh, this, this has been pushed back some, but we're pretty confident in the current schedule. We think this is achievable. Um, so right now we are in our industry review period. Prior to this, uh, which is not captured on this slide, we did have a, an FAA internal review, which essentially means opening up the AC to other lines of business within the FAA to provide comment. Um, most of those comments, not all, most of those comments have been adjudicated and incorporated in the draft that um, has been circulated in the industry. Um, there are a few more, few more um, that are left to be adjudicated, which we, we would require some meetings internally with other lines of business to resolve some questions that we have. But ultimately, they will also be adjudicated alongside comments that we see back um, at the end of the industry review period. Um, and so that period initially was set to um, end in March, um, and it has been extended at the request of um, some industry organizations, uh, extended for another 30 days. So now we're going to map April 5th um, to provide comments. So if you are looking to provide comments and haven't done so already, you have a little bit more time. Um, something that we're looking to do, um, and we're still working out the logistics for, um, would be to do an industry day. Um, we haven't done these, um, at least specific to this AC in the past, but I think we've seen it done with other large ACs like our airport design AC, and it seems to work pretty well. So um, sometime in, in, in May, uh, we would be putting together some industry, an industry, industry day, and we'd be working with parties like USHST and, and others to help facilitate that. And that would be the forum to, to get into a deeper dive discussion on some of the topics that you guys are, are itching to, to talk through. Uh, once we get all the comments back, we've had our chance to internally adjudicate them, and then we would have a discussion with industry stakeholders around, um, you know, around our feedback once we've had a chance to adjudicate the comments. Um, uh, and then once we complete the draft AC in, in June, we will put it off for legal review, um, and then um, legal will adjudicate accordingly and provide comments. We're looking at August for that. And then we're, our hope is to be able to publish a final AC by the end of our fiscal year, which is September. Uh, next slide, please. So um, it just provide a quick summary of some of the changes, which, like I said, are uh, mostly editorial. Next slide. Um, so like I, I mentioned earlier, I'm just looking to um, you know take those separate chapters on GA, transplant hospital, consolidate into one chapter, deal with a lot of the redundancies and repetition that existed in the previous um, AC uh, revision. Um, and then 
separate out the chapters for taxiways and, and visual aids, like I mentioned. Another thing we're doing, which we know was feedback we got, um, was to try to improve the figures. Um, they were not clear, and in some cases, they did not jive with the text. Um, so we deal with a lot of those uh, inconsistencies. Uh, we provided hyperlinks uh, as well, or, or looking to. Um, and um, that's it from an editorial standpoint. Next slide, please. So here's just a, an example of um, that consolidation. It, um, this, this table, um, for those that are familiar, pretty much repeated itself in each chapter for GA transport and hospital. Essentially, we're consolidating here into one table within the heliport design chapter. And this kind of this theme recurs throughout the document as far as the consolidation goes. Next slide. So here's how the figures looked in the prior uh, version of DAC or the current version of DAC. Um, and here's how the, essentially the new figure would look. Um, I think it's easier to, to follow and um, uh, and at least the feedback we've done so far has been, has been largely positive, but uh, obviously those comments are still trickling in. Um, and then next slide. So similarly, in terms of figures, we're also doing some consolidation. So where there are essentially three figures that make the same point, but just for different types of heliports, uh, we're looking to consolidate it into one figure um, here. So next slide. And just a quick mention, I know it's not really uh, um, pertaining to the design AC, but um, you know, on urban air mobility or advanced air mobility, uh, we're doing a lot of work there, um, and what I also wanted to mention, because I know this question comes up a lot, uh, we are not going to integrate the standards for vertiports into the heliport design AC. Um, that's, you know, we've, we had a heliport AC, uh, a vertiport AC, excuse me, in the past. Uh, that was canceled in 2010 due to lack of compatible airport uh, aircraft use. Um, we are looking to use that as a basis um, to develop another vertical design AC. The research to support that is underway. Um, and to that effect, um, going back a year and a half now, we have actually uh, engaged industry, uh, the, the uh, eVTOL industry, to an RFI to try to clean aircraft type and design information. That RFI um, underwhelmingly received only nine submissions. Um, but for, since then, we're, we're looking at other venues and other forms to engage the, not just the RFI respondents, but the broader VTOL industry um, to really address questions on aircraft and infrastructure design, as well as the concept of operations to gain all that supplemental data that we think we need to develop a vertical standard. The reason why that's important to us is, uh, you know, different from how the, uh, the help what you see has, has always been um, written, which is essentially in, in a prescriptive as a prescriptive based standard, we're looking to move to more of a performance based standard for the vertical design um, AC. So the performance data of the AC, um, and I think Rex touched on this in the presentation earlier today, uh, the performance data um, of the aircraft um, and um, you know the susceptibility to different aerodynamic conditions and, and um, their design characteristics, we need to really understand that to, to really develop a a comprehensive vertical design standard. Um, at least in our early thinking, it's not going to be a one size fits all. We will likely have different um, categories uh, and configurations of vertiports um, depending on level of throughput and the aircraft design characteristics and performance. Um, so it'll, it'll look more likely, more like the um, our airport design um, criteria in that respect. Um, so with that, uh, next slide. Yeah, so with that, I'll, I'll uh, pause here for qu comments and questions. The rest of the slides really have to do with the, the other topic, which is the NVG um, study. So I'm sure there's some questions or comments, so uh, I'll uh, take them. Okay, thank you, Robert. If anybody has any questions, um, you can either put it in the chat or just come off mute and ask uh, Robert directly. Uh, Robert, uh, greatly appreciate you coming online today and giving us kind of a quick overview. Um, and then, like Robert had said, uh, the uh, comment period is has been extended to uh, April 5th. And if you want to make comments there, 
online website. If you go to the online website, it actually has the document that you should submit comments through to, to be considered. So, um, any anyone have any uh, questions for Robert or anybody else on the advisory circle as it stands right now? Robert, you may you may get lucky here. I don't know. I don't know. This is just this is not this is too easy. I, I'm not used to this. <laughs> Oh, no worries, no worries. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to make up some questions and send them to you if you need some, so that's all right. Well, uh, hearing none, um, let's go ahead and do a run through on the NVG heliport uh, lighting piece. And if somebody has questions, uh, we, we can uh, entertain those and we may just end up having a uh, longer break this afternoon. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you, if you don't mind, go to the next slide, Rex. Um, so, so as Rex mentioned, um, you know we've we've done um, quite a bit of work on um, NVGs and addressing the compatibility of um, essentially red LED obstruction lights with night vision goggles, um, and ultimately that lab research led to the introduction of specifications for infrared emitters that are now being included in LED obstruction lighting fixtures. Um, so there's an engineering brief that was published and then that engineering brief uh, information was recently incorporated into our obstruction market and lighting advisory circular. Um, and updates were also made to the um, 7460 um, advisory circular as well um, to, to support the operational requirement tied to those specifications. Um, so that that work is, was done, it was successful, um, and um, currently fixtures are being certified to those specifications. Um, there's obviously the question um, around, um, uh, next slide please, sorry. There's also, there's also uh, so this is just a, a picture from um, one of the, the, the flight trials that we did, um, and obviously it's flying on the goggles, you can, can easily detect the, uh, the light the fixture that would that would have been otherwise not visible on the goggles. So um so the specification is once again um proved very effective. Um but obviously there's a question with the green um heliport lights, uh perimeter lights and um compatibility with night vision goggles. Um and this is something that we've been discussing not just within the FA but also within ICAO um and this different schools of thought as far as um, how to address it. Do you address it from the operator side, making some changes to the night vision goggles, or do you address it by making changes or modifications to the fixture? Um, so in our opinion, as the FAA, we're, we, we, are, we, we are biased towards making modifications to the fixture. Um, so in light, in light of that, we're looking to initiate a research project um, this summer uh, that would kind of follow up a similar track to the work we did with, with um, with the obstruction lights to look at developing specifications for um, essentially green heliport perimeter lights to make them compatible with night vision goggles. Um, once the, the research is done, we would put, put out an engineering brief as we did in the prior study um, that would put forward those specifications and then those infrared emitters would now be incorporated into the fixtures that I used to, um, on, to at least to delineate the perimeter of the FADO and the, um, the T-off. Um, and then, um, next slide. This last slide, this is just a, a, um, a, an option we provided um, specific to uh, obstruction lighting, um, which I think was, it's important to, you know, to recognize as we think about uh, heliport lighting and that research as well, which is monitoring. So how do you, because you can't see the light with, with the naked eye, right? Um, because you can see the IR emitter with the naked eye, um, there needs to be a way to monitor this. Um, so we, we address this within our standard and I think we, for obstruction lighting, and I think we would look to do that as well here for heliport lights, um, where essentially you would have an alarm that will be generated to provide an indication of failure. Um, or you have an option where if the IR emitter fails, the, um, the, uh, the visible light is, is de-energized um, as well. Um, so both options are, uh, are would be on the table. I think it would, um, and, and they have been on the table uh, for uh, 
uh, the obstruction lights as well. So once again, that study we're looking to initiate in the summer, um, and uh, we'll obviously be reaching out to any pertinent industry players that could help support that in terms of providing fixtures or expertise in terms of goggles um, or, um, or, or pilots to support our flight trials. Um, and that's pretty much it. Okay, uh, well, actually, this final slide, um, which really just addresses kind of the standards we came up with for the red obstruction light, right? So, um, wavelength, um, beam width, radiant intensity, those are the specifications that, that will be applied um, here as well. Um, and so, the, the one important point I think to make, we would make here is in terms of the beam width, um, we, we look to mirror the beam width of the visible light. So we're not looking to make any changes to photometrics um, for, for perimeter lights as they exist today. We will look to just essentially mirror them. Um, essentially the new requirements that we introduce will be unique to the infrared emitters in terms of the wavelength of the IR and the radiant intensity. Uh, so these, these specs, once again, as you see in the title, uh, are, are related to the obstruction lights and the specs for the heliport lights will be more, more like uh, most likely different than these okay um well thank you um for all that um anything we can do to help um in that space um uh, get more people involved and i know there's a lot of lighting manufacturers that have already started putting out heliport lighting that has infrared emitters um yeah we could definitely have them bring their product to the test center and actually do the evaluations at the same time. But um, I know that uh, we have several people on this call that work in that space as well with the tech center. So uh, we're more than happy to help. But I think moving forward, we'd like yeah, to see that work be done over the next few years and are more than happy to support it. Uh, one thing I'd just comment on what Robert said earlier on one of his um, uh, comments on heliports. Uh, we found, as Robert pointed out, that pretty much if a heliport is designed in accordance with the heliport design guide, its safety record is exceptional. Uh, most of the accidents that we run into uh, in the industry occur at heliports that were not designed in accordance with the heliport design guide. Uh, I think when we looked at the numbers over 97%, were specific to some type of incident that occurred. The other 3% were uh, maintenance related. So it's very high high end on that as far as that risk exposure by not following that design goes. So the design guide in its essence is really, really good. Um, and I appreciate all the work that Robert's been putting into this. I can only imagine how much uh, time that has taken. Uh, Robert, I got a question here uh, for you. Uh, what about having a requirement for obstruction lighting to pulse versus fixed IR lighting? Sometimes obstruction lighting will blend in with other lighting systems. That's, that's um, I, can, I can see how that would be beneficial. Um, I, I can't really opine because we haven't researched that as, as an option, um, but I can see how because we've seen that we did some studies, um, bringing this back to heliports a little bit, we did some studies on when we're looking to develop our lighting requirements for perimeter lights. Um, we did some studies on pulsing the perimeter lights and how the, um, the conspicuity related to a steady um, light. And it was obviously, uh, well, it, what the study showed is that it was, it was far more conspicuous and um, able to grab the attention of the pilot. Um, at, at a greater acquisition distance. So I, I, I can see theoretically how that would be beneficial. Um, something I can take back and maybe um, you know, uh, consider um, in uh, future updates for, for the um, obstruction lighting advisory circular, but not something that we've researched um, in the past. So I, I really can't opine on it, whether we're for or against at this point. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, next question, I'm going to ask the individual to actually come off mute. Hopefully he's um, able to, but Cliff Johnson uh, had a question regarding um, the difference on, on unidirectional lighting. Cliff, are you up? I am, Rex. Can you hear me? I got you loud and clear. 
Okay, hey Robert, great presentations by the way, both on the uh, Helport Design Guide and on this. It's always always good to talk to you and, and see the progress you guys are making. I just had a question on the lighting uh, itself. I know I know a little bit in the space, and I know I, I kind of brought up some of these uh, issues to you from things that we had seen in the past with some of the heliport perimeter lighting. Um, but I remember some of the pilots had mentioned to me before about, you know, some of the taxiway lighting or some of the other lights. And I, I think these are the older type of uh, IR type of lights, um, the non-NVG or the non-LEDs. But some of those that were more like in the unidirectional versus being like a multi-directional one. So if you if you came at it at a certain angle, you'd pick it up. But if not, you wouldn't necessarily see the uh, see the light depending upon you know what angle of approach or things that you're you're on for the taxiways um my question is is there a difference on the heliport lighting on the perimeter lights compared to like some of the older ones that are unidirectional when under the nvg versus with natural vision because i know sometimes with natural vision it's not a problem but i'm not really sure about when you put the nvgs on it's a great question. So it's actually a more focused light um, because you know there's no spillover. Um, so it pretty much the, the 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 light beam stays within whatever the stipulated beam width is for uh, for the um, for the IR. Um, so you're not gonna have. So you really need to be within that beam width to pick up the light. Um, so you you know the angle. That's your point. Is 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 even more critical with the um, with the IR emitter. Okay. versus incandescent light where you have that spillover which pilots over the years have become used to okay yeah because i bring that up because as you as you know you know with some of the heliport approaches and everything where we're coming in and we might have course changes at the FAF that might align out to 30 degrees or so trying to see the the lights at the target and everything just something that we may you know need to be aware of as we as we move forward and happy to help with the eval however i can be of assistance Sure, sure. And and um, just to point out too, horizontally, the beam width is, is essentially 360 degrees. That's um, what, you know, this is the issue we're talking about here is vertically. And But that's that's a good point, uh, Cliff. And I'll be reaching out uh, for sure as we conduct the study. All right. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Cliff. Um, and Tom Judge, you had uh, something specific in, as far as getting the word out. Uh, did you want to uh, ask Robert anything specific? No, I, 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 again, thanks for this presentation. I, you know, it's really helpful. Um, you know, the helipads are are sort of one thing, and we're always challenged with helipads, especially in these cold weather places with lighting that that you know any kind of snow removal takes the lighting out uh, almost instantly. Um, so that's a challenge. But our biggest challenge is is actually still the wind farms. And and it 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 would be I think helpful, you know, as this research matures and all of these are finalized, to really think about getting some of this into the media, so that we're really alerting people of what to look for. Uh, we we find that always helps us, you know, when we're trying to deal with with uh, you know organizations that are putting up vertical obstructions and that we want to make sure they're you know on the latest on lighting. So it's just it's like more like. How do we get it out there? Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point, Tom. Uh, um, and you know, we could do a better job as far as broadcasting some of this information. We do issue CFOs and and other kind of memos, but those are really limited to people that are looking for them, or you know, or you know, who would I be specifically directed to? Um, but I think other ways to promulgate this information um, would be would be helpful. Um, and I'll, I'll, this is also a, a cultural thing within the FAA, honestly. And I think, you know, at least within airports, we've been a little reticent about in media engagement in the past. And I think we're starting to open up a little bit more to, to you know, um, interviews and articles and, you know, things that get the word out. Um, so I think in this case, we're, we would likely do more of that um, than we've done in the past. Um, but it's it's a great point. No, I think we might be able to help in that space, Robert, to some degree. Um, we work with some people in the wind farm, wind turbine manufacturing and operating area. Uh, that may be a route that we can take from a marketing standpoint, so to speak, and try to funnel that information back that route. Uh, because you're right, there's 
not a lot of people that probably read aviation safos that uh, run wind turbine farms maybe uh, so that that may be a ushst um, challenge for the next years to help get the word out on that I, I think we can do that 